Okay, great. So this is the November 15th meeting of the Web RTC Working Group. We abide by the W3C patent policy and only people and companies that are listed on this website are allowed to make substantive contributions. Got a lot to cover today. We're gonna to talk about encoded transform, a bit about timing models, um, some discussion of face detection, uh, message port on capture handle, media capture main. We have two more, uh, one more meeting this year and another one scheduled for January. And that is usual, uh, that info is up on the wiki site. The next meeting will be December 7th. I know the meeting's been moving around a bit, but that's what we settled on. Okay, a bit about this meeting. The slides, as usual, are up on the wiki. Um, we're being recorded. And do we have a volunteer for note-taking? I'll do it, Bernard. Okay, thank you, Don. OK, a little bit about the code for conduct. We do operate under it, and we're all passionate, but let's try to keep it cordial and professional. Uh, people have probably figured out how to use Google Meet by now, but uh, if you want to get in the queue, type plus Q and minus Q uh, to get in and out, use headphones, et cetera, and uh, uh, state your name for the, for the minutes. OK, I don't think we'll do any polls today, but we could. All right. So just the usual reminder about document status, where it is in the repo, it doesn't tell you if it's adopted. Uh, adoption requires a call for adoption. Editors, drafts don't represent consensus, but working groups do. Uh, it is possible to merge PRs that lack consensus if the notes attached that indicate it. All right, so here's what's on the agenda. We have uh, 20 minutes for encoded transform discussions. Uh, we have a few issues from Weber to CPC. I'm going to talk a little bit about some timing model progress and, in general, about video frame metadata. And then we're going to have a discussion uh, from Riju on face detection. Um, and uh, then some uh, sessions on message port on capture handle and media capture main. All right, a lot to do today. So Harold, turn it over yeah. to you. So we had fun at ITF. As usual, uh, Saturday and Sunday at ITF has this uh, event called Hackathon, which basically get, means you can uh, grab a table, invite people to come uh, come over, and uh, attack some problems. It works best if you have the problem lined up ahead of time and uh, a specific target in mind, and there, and a lot of people coming. Well, we didn't uh, get quite uh, get it this time, but we got a few people saying interested, but I uh, can't make it. So nobody came actually. But I did some experimentation anyway, and I think I learned something. Next slide. So I sketched out an API that we might want to have uh, for encoded frames that would allow, allow me to code up the use cases I could think of at, off the top of my head. So it's model of the breakout box, which is that you have a consumer producer interface and a consumer interface. And we add explicit signals that go in the opposite direction of the of the frame stream that uh, and turn all, on all this uh, 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 and uh, define how to connect these things to into RTP senders and RTP receivers. I follow the pre-WG pre model of how to enable frame frames. That is, you just you tell the pre-connection that you're going to going to work at it, and you do it on the main thread. But uh, change the API around so that the process of saying I want the I, the I want frames from this connect from the sender or receiver to go here. And uh, I want to insert frames into the sender or receiver here. They are separate calls because uh, uh, a lot of the use cases will only use one of them. All, the, all of this is described in the repository that I created for the hackathon. Next. So I, I did manage to get two demos written of here's how the whole code would look if all this worked. And uh, I made one very simple demo, kind of, yes, the API, the APIs that are 
similar to the JavaScript uh, compile. Um, it's the frame counter demo uh, that counts how many frames that uh, have has passed by and display displays it on somewhere. And this is fully supported by the shim that emulates propo the proposed API. So you can run this in the existing browser, which is kind of cute. And I also did a demo of, of here's how we connect up things that take an incoming track and pass it, pass it out to, to an outgoing track without touching the bits. And uh, well, this is uh, part of what you can't do with a current API at least in the current browser. So I got the shim to start up and give a, give me the expected error message very quickly. We didn't, so I didn't get around to doing demos using singles. Next slide. So I said that that we, that uh, the, the API I, I proposed to myself, this is a very self-referential thing, needed a a producer API and a consumer API, and then connect them together. But uh, when I wrote the demos, I found that uh, that I really only needed producers. And then if you have a processing element that you can write, write it as you create it, passing in the producer to the, to the create function. And then in the end, you can take the output of the pipeline and connect it to, uh, to the API for saying, here's here's the producer that is going to produce frame for you. So this kind of proves that experimentation is good when you want to do API design, because if you don't need something for the three first things you do, that's a big chance it's not needed at all. Next slide. So this is a frame counter example. The First line is how you how you get the stream of frames with the in an object that also has the has the callback functions that you need to control bandwidth and uh, generate keyframes and so on. And then you define the an, a class a JavaScript class that uh, does the processing for you. Simple as that. And then connect it to the outgoing frame. Out, outgoing stream. So this is a bump in the stack. But the thing is that with this API, there's no requirement that uh, the, the same pair connection is used at both ends. It just happens that uh, that's the only thing that works at the moment. Next. So that's what I did and what, what I think we learned that Okay, it's possible to write something using this API shape and then see wh what we can support about it. But Peter wanted to tell us something about what he did. And not, th not at the same time, but uh, and some tests at, of what's possible. Peter, take it away. All right, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So I actually did my little kind of hackathon at the at TPAC or during TPAC. Um, but during Harold's hackathon, um, I copied it into this GitHub repository. So I did participate a little. Basically, I was trying to find out how much of what Harold's describing in a kind of one way API um, can we do with the existing kind of two way API? Uh, could we build a shim for one to the other? And I found that I could produce uh, a one-way API for transport and another for codec. And I got it working between a client uh, in a web browser and a server running a WebRTC stack. Um, but it, ha it lacks a few things. And I had some ideas for how to work around that. But looking at Harold's um, proposed API, it basically checks all the boxes. So I'll get into a little more detail next slide. If you want to, for example, turn the existing API into just the way to send something, no encode or decode, you just want to send. Uh, basically, all you do is read, uh, or sorry, write to the writable stream of the sender. The problem 
or the thing that's lacking is that you can't call this constructor where it says new RTC encoded audio frame or encoded video frame. That's the big problem. And I did work around that, but it's it's pretty ugly. Uh, so I could make it work, but it would be really nice to have that constructor. And uh, there's no congestion control feedback here to let you know how much you should write, which is one of the things uh, Harold proposed. So next slide. On the receive side, you just read from the receiver, uh, the readable stream of the receiver, and you do something with the data. So that, that's actually pretty straightforward. Next slide. If you want to make a one-way thing that looks like an encoder, uh, you just have to read from the sender and do something with the encoded frame.data. But you don't have a way of controlling it other than uh, having your server send back, say, FIRs and REMBs or something like that. You might be able to use the RTP sender uh, set parameters, but that would only be able to go uh, lower than what the uh, congestion co control was doing. So some direct controls might be nice. And that's, again, one of the things Harold uh, pointed, added in his uh, proposed API. Next slide. On the flip side, if you want a decoder, you just uh, write to the RTP sender. And again, you would want a constructor so that you can pass something in. And you can work around that, but it's hacky. And you don't have a way of knowing when that thing needs a keyframe, other than, again, I got this working client to server. The server could read the FIR that gets sent over the network, but then having to out of band send a message back, and it's kind of awkward. Next slide. So if we put all the things together that it lacks, uh, I think there are five things, as I mentioned, uh, a way to construct one of these objects of an encoded frame, a way to uh, get the bandwidth estimate on um, the sending side, a way to control the bandwidth toward the encoder, um, a way to generate generate keyframes for the encoder, and a way to know on the decoder side if a keyframe is necessary. And if we added those to the existing API, then we'd basically be able to do all the uh, use cases I can think of, which is almost exactly what Harold said. Uh, and I looked at his proposed API, and it does all five of these things. So. Um, I think his proposal is really good. And I, I do think we could ha very hackily work around these things, but uh, it'd be much better to add direct API points. That's it. So here's the point where we ask for comments. Yuan. Yep. Um, so for uh, these five things, I think there, there is already a proposal for the keyframe uh, for encoder. We we already have uh, something in encoded transform, so it's it's already good. Uh, for the constructor for encoded audio and encoded video frame, I, I'm not sure. I'm just I'm really understanding why we need uh, the decode path because if we have the data, then we have web codecs to actually do the decode, and and then you you can. You can create uh, a track for it, or you can render it yourself. So, what, what's I'm not sure I understand the point of uh, using peer connection for incoming data because if you have the data, you do not well, need peer connection to decode it. You can use web codecs. Can I answer that? Yeah. Okay, so there are two big ones. Number one, there might be a browser that implements this but doesn't implement web codecs. I would love it if all the browsers implemented web codecs. You can let me know if that's a possibility, Ewan. Uh, I think I, I think that um, Mozilla and, and Safari are actually uh, prototyping things there. Great. Uh, but there's a second one, which is that web codecs does not have a jitter buffer built in. This does. Um, at the same time, I heard a lot that we, we want these kind of uh, things to actually let the web application handle its jitter buffer uh, on its own. So, right. if, so if you if you're there, getting if you're getting to full JavaScript like that, why why not doing the uh, rendering and, and so on in JavaScript and, and be done with it? 
So that, that's where I'm trying to understand where we get the benefits. Yeah, so I, I think that if web codecs is there and you want to do your own jitter buffer, then perhaps this is not needed. But if you wanted to get the same behavior that you would get at a WebRTC today, because again, you can do this today, uh, but wanted it to be uh, more convenient because you don't want to write your own jitter buffer, then that might be a benefit here. OK, use cases would be interesting. Uh, like. More, uh, for, for the constructor for encoded audio frame and video frame. Maybe for the others as well, but the others I think are, are, are much more straightforward in terms of uh, use cases. So, so one, of, one of the use cases that we, that needs this is actually the get an incoming video frame and pass it out over, the, over a different pair connection. And in particular, the case where you have an incoming video frame and pass it on two pair connections. And so you, OK, so you want to re, re forward it? Possibly, yes. But you, so maybe what you want is just a serialization, like a way to transfer an, encoded, an existing encoded audio frame to another worker. That does not need a constructor there because you already have the encoded audio frame and you just want to pass it to some of the API and modify it because uh, I suspect strongly that uh, method at least metadata needs rewriting. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see about the use cases. Uh, yeah, so uh, sorry, I'm having a bit of uh, trouble <clears throat> getting to high level problems we're solving. And maybe that was from last meeting. Um, it seems to me that if you wanted to forward, uh, and is this instead of uh, what might you see in Coda Transform, or is it is it reimagining of it? Is it addressing small problems with it? And I'm a bit. I'm just a bit, a bit confused about how it all fits in. Like forwarding a, a we already have, <coughs> excuse me, um, readable, writable streams APIs on the medium stream track, for example. So, what, since I, I can, it sounds to me that I can already receive a track on a pair connection, a media stream track, <coughs> and if I want to forward it, I can. I can also inject JavaScript code and get the video frames from that uh, track. So how is that different from from this? Well, uh, where are you at, TPAC? Yeah. Did you hear the use cases presented there? Well, if you could do a refresher uh, in this context, it might help more readers than me. But if it's just me, that's fine. Yeah, uh, I think I think I can't. Uh, Reproduce the TPAC, the TPAC discussions <laughs> directly, but uh, to my mind, uh, the cases were quite compelling. That uh, it was not possible to ad address this in a sensible manner without significant extensions of the uh, WebRTC encoder frame API. Of course, uh, mm, whether or not this should be an additional API to that API or a replacement or an extension. That's something that depends on the shape of the API and the will of the, of the people working on it. OK, I see uh, uh, Peter's raised his hand. Is that in response to Yeah, Yeah, I was, yeah, okay. I was specifically when you're talking about forwarding, you cannot forward well unless you know what the bandwidth estimation is on the send end, right? You got stuff coming in, you want to forward it out, but you, you can't know what to do unless you have a bandwidth estimate. So that's one of the things that you would need. Um, you could reuse the encoded audio frames and encoded video frames to just forward them as is, but you might want to repackage or something in between. Like you're basically acting like an SFU when you're forwarding, right? 
And you can't do that easily if you don't have a constructor for them. Uh, and if you need to forward the need for a keyframe, you need to know that the receive end, or the, you know, the one you're sending to needs a keyframe. So the things I'm saying the API lacks are exactly the things you would need for the use case you just brought up. OK. Um, yeah, I guess it wasn't clear to me, you know, uh, I was expecting more representation. Uh, here, here are the things we lack, and uh, here are the changes we want to make in based on the existing specs that we have. And it's not clear whether this is instead of or, or on top of. But uh, well, I, I I didn't think it was the right time to say here's what I think the API should look like. But Harold did have a link to where he thought it could look like, and I looked at that and thought that that's great. Checks all the boxes. So. I'm not particular about the shape of it so much as like these are the things that in my experience trying to build on top of the existing thing that this is what is lacking. Yeah, this uh, this was also the reason why I chose this particular presentation format. I mean, to keep the discussion from TPAC going and uh, to not lock ourselves into an API shape until until we have actually worked through whether the use cases that we want to support are possible or simple with the API shapes we want. So uh, we've uh, we've had a, had the experience before of uh, locking ourselves into APIs a, API shapes and then and, and having to revise them later than we should have. I mean, the many many iterations of the constraints API is kind of one of the one of the experiences that I don't want to repeat. So I'm trying to stimulate the discussion. For what it's worth, I think that these things can be added with fairly minimal additions, like adding a constructor. That's not a lot. A signal for a bandwidth estimate. That's not a lot. Now these, these our generic keyframe has already been proposed, so I don't think this is like a big delta between what we have. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Okay, we're approximately on time with this item, so we should just go on. Uh, sorry, what are the next steps, or is there any? Decision to document. So I didn't see a. I didn't see a particular de decision. Consensus on the on the decision, but it seems that uh, we need to enumerate the use to enumerate and illustrate the use cases a bit more before we before we make a before we make a proposal for a change. So at least uh, Peter and I will continue to iterate on use cases. OK, what about CPC? OK, so here are the issues we're going to talk about today. Uh, 2795, 96, and 2724. Okay, 2795. Ooh, one out of four slides. I think there's there supposed to be only two slides, but maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think I FIPO added two more. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so uh, at last interim, we started to uh, discuss the possibility to expose the um, server reflexive or relay ser server error. So you have a candidate, it's a server reflexive or it's relay, and you, you got it from a particular server. And it's it's nice to expose uh, the URL uh, on the candidate. Um, in WebRTC 1.0, it was uh, exposed uh, in, the in the candidate event. And uh, at last meeting, it was proposed to move it to, uh, to the candidate object itself. And um, one thing we did not really talk about was uh, 
whether um, this new parameter would survive uh, JSON uh, stringification and recreation. So you have a nice candidate, uh, you tr translate it into JSON uh, by uh, calling to JSON, and then you send it over the wire, you reconstruct it, and then it should be the same. So before the introduction of the uh, error parameter, there, there is full fidelity, meaning that you, you all uh, the different uh, attributes are the same before and after serialization. So that's why I added uh, this uh, JavaScript there where you can assert that uh, the, co the clone and the candidate are exactly the same. And the spec is saying, yeah, it's supposed to, to work this way. Um, so there's the, the question of whether we actually uh, want to preserve that uh, for the Earl or not. Uh, and that's something we need to discuss because we did not really discuss it at uh, last interim. Next slide. So the, the two questions I have is, um, so do we want to share a, a server reflexive or relay server Earl to remote parties? So do we want to uh, expose it, uh, like you call to JSON, uh, do, do we want to have it there or not? That's uh, something, or do we want to omit it, this information by default? Of course, with JavaScript, you can uh, call to JSON and uh, later on add the URL to uh, the, uh, the JSON object itself, if you want it. But what, what's the default? That's uh, the first question. And uh, the second question is, um, do we want to keep the ice candidate current model? Uh, so the current model is, if you call into JSON and you reconstruct it, then it's always the same. Uh, do we want to keep that uh, behavior or do we are, or are we fine with the idea that yeah two JSON will be uh, lossy and that's fine and uh, developers will, will not care a, a lot. So that, that these are my the two questions I have to, to the working group. Uh, I passed it my personal position which is that uh, there's probably no use case to expose uh, these um, Earl to the yeah, two JSON to other parties. So probably you would not want that. And I think we should keep the current model, which is simple and consistent. So which would mean uh, reverting at our uh, past decision and uh, just expose, keeping the uh, URL information to uh, the event and not the candidate. And there's a small JavaScript uh, there, which allows to very easily shim uh, the behavior uh, that is currently in the spec, meaning to, um, keep the URL in the candidate, but not exposing via to JSON. It's uh, two, two lines of code, uh, so it's fairly straightforward. And uh, I guess that for uh, the first slide, I will uh, pass it down to uh, Fibo. Thank you. So I agree that we shouldn't expose the URL of the turn server that you gathered the candidate from to the other side. No discussion about that. Next slide, please. So if we look at to Jason, this is historically first exposed SDP mid mline index and candidate string. And we only added username fragment a bit later. I think Peter Satcher did that. And this is what's necessary for ICE. And I'm not proposing to change that. Most of that can be extracted of the extra attributes can be extracted from the candidate line. But yes, relay protocol cannot be. And this already breaks this identity assertion. The URL cannot be, but we also have a problem with username fragment and generation and any other RC 4245 extension attributes that are not translated to the object. Next slide. And the question is, why do we have these extra properties on the ICE candidate? And I think Guido added that back in the day, we wanted to stop developers from parsing the candidate string themselves because that was very error prone. And the use case for this is typically to learn about the network topology, to understand whether you're on a network that, for example, blocks UDP and requires a fallback to TCP, or you want to check your turn server. For example, if you have a relay candidate that has a private IP address. You would like to know which turn server it was gathered from. And we also have the candidate pair change event, which exposes the local and remote candidates. And typically, you want to know 
what kind of connection you have, whether you relate or not, and maybe which I server you're going after. Currently, that's done using get sets, where both URL and relay protocol have been available for a while. And I think putting it on the candidate object itself instead of the ice candidate event will automatically make it available there as well, which is much more useful. Questions? So I think that what we're saying is that uh, in both cases, you can, you can do it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a question of what is um, most convenient and what, what is uh, uh, less uh, error prone or uh, uh, less surprising to, to web developers. Uh, yes, so, and it's, so it's doing it on the candidate is easier than asking people to use statistics for that. You, you so, mean for uh, the Yana candidate per change event? Yes. Because you so, cannot Yana, really correlate your, your ice candidate object from the event with anything from stats, unless you say that it's the same if the IP and port matches. But that's a special comparison. I don't see anyone yeah, else. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I, I like, uh, thanks for breaking down uh, Pippo, the reasons. And so it sounds like Pippo, you were saying there already are items that that are exposed on the candidate that are not part of 2JSON that you cannot reconstruct from the uh, candidate line. Is that right? Yes. For example, relay protocol, which would return a different <clears throat> thing in Firefox if you try to extract it the same way as you do in Chrome. OK. So you and that, that seems to be a precedent then for actually having something that already breaks the you cannot copy a, a candidate and have it be the same, right? Yes. Is that right, Ivan? Um, haven't checked that, but that's, uh, that's, um, that's not in the spirit of a spec then. So uh to to me that the spec is saying if you're calling to json and then you're calling uh, rtc ice candidate on the to json object then you you're recreating the the same thing and it should be the same values should be exposed to the rtc candidates objects on both of them if that's not the case uh then maybe we should make the spec clear or maybe you should ask, understand why this is the case and whether there's a bug there because that, that's surprising to me when i read the spec at least Yes, I think, I think uh, this, go ahead. No, Fipo, go ahead. Um, I think the problem is that we're currently trying to treat local and remote candidates the same, but local candidates can have more information attached to them. Yeah, and my, my understanding was that um, the uh, event is a sort of the local candidate, and the uh, event is saying, OK, there's this one and there's this other value. It's true that the candidate pair change uh, event is exposing the local and the remote, and that's where it's uh, actually uh, interesting to uh, to have that. But other than other than there, uh, maybe there's no no use case. Yes, but for example, in statistics, we're also differentiating a lot between local and remote candidates. So there's precedent for that as well. So uh, I think my preference, if you're asking the members here, uh, is that I agree we should not send it to remote parties. And I think that means we cannot include it into JSON because existing code would then ship it to remote parties. Um, I think I uh, also W3C design pattern for events is to not put members on events, but if you can put them on the event target instead. So I think I would here lean toward uh, putting it on the candidate. And not have it be part of JSON because there's some seems to be precedent for that. 
I mean, the, the way I see it is that the Ice Candidate is sort of a, a hybrid thing in the face already, and it's trying to both be what you need to send to the other side, but also a helpful, uh, here's some extra local information interface. So, and I think we already have that. So, so in, this in, doesn't seem that different. In, in that case, you probably need to uh, be able to to create an RTC ICE candidate that has a non uh, null URL, because that's, for instance, if you create an event, you should be able to perfectly shim it. And uh, currently, we, we cannot do that. So that would mean we would at least need to change the constructor there. Well, you could you could write a shim that reads the URL and inserts it into the new object. You just can't rely on the constructor doing it for you. Well, it's not the so, same uh, prototype and so on. So, uh, so the so. In my opinion, uh, the candidate is behaving like a data object. It has no in, inherent behavior. And uh, people expect to copy data objects. And people who see a two JSON method generally expect that that, that object, that will return something that can be turned back into the same data object. And I think the idea of breaking that pattern, as we might have done already by accident, but uh, we shouldn't repeat, we shouldn't continue to do so, is a bad idea. But uh, the backward compatibility problem we have is that uh, users are today using to JSON as if it was package up candidate in a that in a, in a form that only presents what only presents the stuff I want I want to send to a remote party. And that's a bad thing. So it was a mistake to have two JSON be used for for doing the transmis transmittable form of a candidate. I think it was a correct decision to put uh, the URL information on the candidate. But I don't know where how we should get out of this boundary, where doing the right thing according to the, the common meaning of 2JSON will not do the right thing for people who don't expect the URL information to be shared with, shared without someone else. Uh, if we accept the argument that we can't uh, change uh, what goes into two JSON, then uh, we have stuck ourselves with a with an API wart forever. If we accept that two JSON will grow more members over time, and not all of these are the stuff that is interesting to send to remote parties then I, I think the path that leads towards the place we want to be is, uh, uh, I think, to add a method that is extracting the information and only the information that is needed to pass a candidate to a remote party. I guess we could also expose um, a local candidate construct somehow probably that's the issue there we we don't we don't have we're using the same object for like three different things and that's the difficulty there subclassing uh, subclassing uh, uh, candidates to have remote can uh, remote candidate and uh, and local candidate as subclasses this would would be an interesting idea they would of course have different two JSON methods I guess only one would have a two JSON object. Yeah. Well, uh, Jan over here, I'm worried with chasing technical purity here, and that I agree it is a word already, and that we have an interface that's serving two purposes. If we subclass, I'm not sure that will get us out of it because it still depends on what do you get on 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 ice candidate. What is, what interface would you get? You would get a local candidate, but if if you then package that up, then that be, then you're sending that to the other side, which we didn't want. So. Uh, I think there's precedent in the web platform for custom two JSON, where not every web interface is necessarily enumerable, but you can still get the properties if you want them. 
So, so I kind of feel we already have a work. So I would like to see if we're going for technical purity, we should check that we have technical purity before beforehand before uh, dealing with this problem with the URL. Like right. it's a URL, the only problem we don't have technical purity. Uh, just a warning: there's four minutes, only four minutes left in this section of the meeting. Okay, well, let's, con let's continue that on GitHub then, and uh, uh, try to finish the discussion there. So we had uh, two other issues. Do we want to go there? Go there. Two seven nine six. All right, this is uh, me. Let's see one second. I'm on the same slide here. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> um, simulcast is back. Um, we found some more corner cases uh, in, uh, and especially to do with rollback. Uh, RFC eight eight two nine says about rollback that a transceiver must not be removed because normally uh, a, a transceiver that was created by set remote description. If you roll it back, it disappears. But it must not be removed if a track was attached to the transceiver via the add track method. Uh, and so this is sort of an application may call add track, then call set remote description with an offer, then roll back that offer, then call create offer and still have an M section. Fine. Uh, but this is a bit, um, creates a bit uh, unusual situation where um, an add track, so if a set remote description has happened, uh, for a simulcast offer, for example, if you then call add track, if the application calls add track, you can actually save, effectively save a, a, a transceiver that set remote description created for this offer from being rolled back. So which is a bit of a magic trick. But anyway, um, so this is already a corner case and we still need to iron out how this is going to work. Um, and we found some inconsistencies here that in Chrome, which was the browser that worked the best here, I think, still uh, would, Chrome would, um, in, in Chrome, simulcast is rolled back to a readless unicast if the transceiver was created by ad track, i.e. you called ad track and then set remote description. But if you called set remote description and then ad track, it didn't. So uh, the proposal is to roll back simulcast to readless unicast also for transceivers created by set remote description. And what this would do is it would make things more consistent and it makes ad track behave the same before and after set remote description. And it avoids having to deal with this unicorn, which is an unassociated simulcast ad track transceiver. Because now, and we avoid having to wonder what does reassociating an ad track transceiver that already has simulcast mean? So, uh, and this seems like a defensible interpretation of RFC section 41102, which says that rollback discards any proposed changes to the session, returning the state machine back to stable state. Meaning that we we also have we already have language for for if you call the ad track to create a transceiver and then the rollback modify that transceiver and then you roll back the offer, put it back the way it was before and undo. Uh, but we just haven't implemented. Uh, I think it also makes sense to interpret that advice to mean we, if it's if a set remote description creates a transceiver, then then a later application fishes out by attaching an ad track. At that time, uh, it, you shouldn't be able to pull out a simulcast receiver out of that because uh, the simulcast, the thing that introduced simulcast was rolled back. So it's sufficient to just what we should do is basically restore that to a basically plain old uh, unicast transceiver, which I think goes with the original tent, intent here of uh, not undermining the application's intent. So that you, you can call ad track and still basically have negotiation things happen and you still have a track at the end, but it's not magically simulcast based on, you know, that seems like action at a distance that we can avoid. Thoughts? Any objections to that? 
It seems reasonable to me. Yeah, to me as well. All right, great. So no ac action item on Yaniva to, to propose a PR? Yes. All right, next slide. All right, so separate issue also to do with um, uh, negotiation and simulcast. Um, last month's meeting, uh, we drastically reduced the cases of where set remote description could fail, as in reject or, uh, or uh, their promise is promise. And so we, we got it down. We had one remaining item when it came to RID negotiation that we still failed over. And we're basically, to read the note here, like a change in RID values is tolerated from remote offers to receive simulcast as long as at least one RID matches a RID in the encodings that were previously negotiated, or the offers to no longer uh, receive simulcast. Uh, so uh, we basically said we would, uh, implementations are still, uh, last month we tried to move the spec closer to implementations because implementations weren't rejecting on any of this. And uh, we stopped at this one thing, and my proposal is basically to remove it as well, because it turns out uh, implementations aren't failing, and it's actually simpler to just drop down to the first layer and answer with unicast, which is what the RFC 8853 uh, that, that governs offer answer uh, would like to have happen. Uh, because there's actually, according to that RFC, there's very few situations where an SR, etc., remote description offer should error out due to an inconsistency with something previously negotiated. Only things like removal of end sections are required there. So uh, the proposal is basically to remove this section and next slide and add a couple of uh, a single line uh, further down in green that in the answer, we basically pick up this new situation uh, where we say if description indicates that simulcast is no longer supported or desired or description is missing all of the previously negotiated layers then remove all dictionaries in the send encoding except for the first one and abort these subsets basically answer with unicast so this would match uh local this would match chrome and safari i believe um even though there's a i filed a cr bug on an inconsistency there where it seems to leave the encodings uh, if you, it doesn't seem to reduce the number of codings in that case, but I think that's a bug. Any concerns with this? Any objections to making this change? This is uh, this is the one where you discovered that uh, Chrome uh, disables layers rather than removing them. In this case, yeah, doesn't sound unreasonable to me. Once we, we because we already accepted the language that says that we remove layers instead of just disabling them. Uh, yes, I'm very happy with how little I had to change here. That so seems to fall in line, which I think is a good sign that uh, it doesn't introduce new behaviors. It just extends them. Yeah. All right, I'm not hearing any objection. Uh, I think th I think this works. Will you uh, will you add that add tests too? Uh, yes, uh, tests will come from uh, Firefox, adding set parameters to spec. Good. Shortly. Cool. Thank you. Okay. okay. Five minutes uh, uh, Hopefully we can get back on track here. This will be should be short. Um, so a little bit of an update on video frame metadata, which has been in discussion in the media working group. Actually, hold on. Let me stop sharing and uh, uh, go back. Okay, 
Let's start again. Okay. All right. Uh, so a little bit of uh, update on what's been going on in the media working group. Um, the group created a video frame metadata registry, uh, which now has registration requirements, which among other things require a spec that's been a, uh, a working group work item in a working group. Um, the process is that you enter registration requests as a web, as web codex issues. And an example is issue 607, which is uh, human face metadata. We're going to be talking about that in the next presentation. Um, a little bit about the relationship with the request video frame callback specification, which was originally in a communi uh, community group and now I believe will be merged into the HTML5 uh, specification. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that. But basically, there's been questions about the relationship between the video frame callback metadata defined there um, and video frame metadata, such as whether they should inherit. Um, and also whether some of those uh, frames exposed, some of those attributes exposed in the video frame callback metadata should be exposed in, in video frame metadata. So we'll talk about um, a few of the implications of this. So this is what the, the callback metadata that is in this uh, request video frame callback spec. Um, and you'll notice a few things. Um, there's uh, timing info at all aspects of the pipeline. So um, for example, you have things like the capture time um, and uh, the RTP timestamp, uh, but also the receive time. Um, and then uh, as you get closer to displaying, you get the processing duration, you get the expected display time, the presentation time, et cetera. So a whole bunch of timing info that's that's relating to various uh, points in the in the processing pipeline. So um, what's interesting about this is is it mixes not only what I would call codec uh, related timing, but also RTP things relating to RTP like the RTP timestamp. Um, so this brought up a whole bunch of uh, questions, at least in my mind, as to what where this metadata is exposed in various aspects of the APIs we've been working on in this working group. So as an example, um, if in media capture transform, when I convert from a track to a stream of video frames, should I expect some metadata to be in those video frames? Like for example, will I, if I look at video frame dot capture time, uh, will I see that? Um, Obviously, it seems like there's also assumptions about what will be going on in WebRTC PC. Um, for example, like if I if I call the RBFC is, uh, spec and look at video frame dot RTP timestamp, that the timestamp will be there. Um, the only way it would have gotten there would have been through RTP processing, like in WebRTC PC. Um, how does that work exactly? Um, and also, is the metadata passed across the pipeline? For example, when, when I go through the send to the receive side, how does, how does that work exactly? Um, an example of this is if I uh, look at media capture transform, say I convert to a stream of video frames, do some stuff, call a video frame generator, um, and then pass this to WebRTC, uh, at the end of it all on the receive side, is this metadata visible in RBFC? And at what points um, can I get at it in the, in the uh, media transform as well. For example, um, yeah, is it, it it somehow gets passed from the video frames into the track and then gets uh, it goes through the WebRTC encoder and gets passed on the wire, et cetera. How does all that work? Um, another example would be, is this metadata available in encoded transform? For example, is it a property of uh, encoded chunks in encoded transform or in, in web codecs as well? Um, or is it does it somehow get lost in there? Anyway, um, all, none of this was particularly clear to me. Um, so you have this metadata, but it's not clear exactly um, how it works within the specs we've been working on. Um, and so my question to the working group is, are there issues here um, that should be filed um, and, uh, and explored in the working group? Comments? I'm in the queue. Um, 
yeah you went yeah so i, I filed some some of these issues uh the plan is actually for capture time after the timestamp and so on to move from video frame callback metadata to video frame metadata right and then there is consistency meaning that if you're creating a a media capture track uh, for video track generator and the video frame metadata like capture time is set then it will be available uh, if you're actually displaying the track to video element and calling request video frame callback so this should be very consistent there and uh, it should like media capture transform um, will um, will not preserve by magic all these things it's just that if you pass a video frame that has this metadata, uh, what happens is you're actually cloning the, the, the video frame, so the metadata will also be cloned. That's what is happening. For Weber TCPC, for instance, uh, the capture time might be encoded as an RTP, uh, RTP header. So if the RTP header is not uh, dropped on the floor, it will end up on the receive side if you're calling request video frame callback or if you are getting the video frame for media capture transform uh, from the peer connection uh, and that, that should work fine in encoded chunks we are not exposing that metadata uh, maybe we should like maybe uh, the capture time in the encoded transform is something that is useful and that we should expose at the uh, encoded uh, video chunk uh, level for instance uh, we haven't received feedback or use cases there so it should be per uh, per uh, per use cases um are there issues for this working group to discuss um maybe for instance um we have a working group that is somehow responsible to say you have a track and you pass it to the media element and you you process it and you render it uh so how do you compute presentation time for instance which is something that is exposed to video frame request video frame callback right. uh may, maybe we we should actually uh have something there because uh, the video track generator is allowing you to to set various timestamps but how will it, uh, what will happen on the render side if you're using a video element uh, that's not something that we are uh, defining in any way so you can do jitter buffer you can do you, you can do what the user agent can do what, whatever it wants and may, maybe that that is something that is hurting and that uh, we should try to to dig into and uh, give more precision so that uh, uh, user agents are more aligned Uh, Harold? Uh, if uh, a processing element uh, has metadata defined as part of both its input and its output, then uh, the question is, should we have a general rule about the metadata that it does not understand? I mean, for metadata that, it, that this particular process ele processing element knows about like uh, an encoder will probably add encoded frame size width and height uh, for instance uh, then that will not be passed unchanged but should we ask for a general principle that uh, a processing element with metadata on both the inside and the outside passes along metadata that it doesn't understand because yeah, I don't I, think we can expect all, all processing elements to understand all the metadata all the time. Yeah, so the rules for the registration is that the, the behavior is supposed to be defined in the spec. So the registry doesn't define any behavior, right? It just cites stuff. Um, and the problem is that um, I guess what you're, there, there is no general rule that's imposed by the registry. Um, I mean, you could decide, uh, and I don't know that the, it, we are, there's going to be, uh, you're going to get all the working groups in W2C to agree on the general rule, you know, for every API. Um, it would be possible within a given spec to say this is what, you know, what, what this spec does. Um, but that's kind of about it. I, I guess my, I guess what I'm saying, Harold, is that it's everything is, un, is, is undefined. If you have a proposal for a rule, <laughs> it would be great to, to hear it um, yeah i agree with bernard there i think that for instance for web codex the feedback we received that was that uh javascript can handle the, the metadata passing from the uh, video frame to the encoded video chunk 
So web codec does not have to handle it itself. Let's JavaScript do it. But for WebRTC and Codic Transform, it's a bit different because we, we are passing video frame as a track, and then on the uh, transform, we get uh, encoded chunks. And maybe there, it would be nice if we could um, pass metadata from one to the other. And I guess the registry of the metadata data, it could say that. It could say, hey, for WebRTC and Codic Transform, this metadata is preserved and is exposed as that in, uh, in the uh, encoded video chunk, for instance. Um, I, I guess. We, could, we should sort this out when we are seeing compelling use cases where, yeah, this metadata should actually go there. For our metadata, currently, we do not have any, uh, any API. So you cannot like stick any JavaScript object. So when, if we go there, then that's another uh, topic that we should uh, rediscuss. Yeah. So I think we've run out of time on this topic. But I think the next step is probably to file issues about specific specs. Do you agree, UN? Uh, yeah, I think we tried to uh, to file these issues on web codecs. The, the one we might be missing is uh, like uh, having the renderer side on uh, media capture main. Maybe uh, right. are we able to clarify it? So that that might be the missing issue that we should. And find. also maybe media capture transform. Um, okay, so I th I, th I think what we'll do is we'll we'll try to file specific issues and bring this up and bring them up in future future meetings. All right, thank you. Uh, so now we're going to uh, pass the baton uh, to uh, the Intel folks to talk about face detection. Yeah, thanks, Bernard. Uh, Ritsu is traveling today, so I will cover him and discuss about the face detection today. And we have now updated our face detection proposal, which uses the new video frame metadata. Uh, and as Bernard introduced, uh, we now have the metadata uh, method in the video frame, which allows returning uh, the video frame specific metadata to applications. And we updated our our proposal so that um, it's it's now adding a member into the video frame metadata, which is used as the description for the uh, faces found in that video frame. And in that process, we also sensed the detected face uh, member to human face. And this is to anticipate uh, future ex extensions into the video frame metadata, because so we wanted to be more specific, uh, so it's human face in the case that some other kind of faces would be added later into the video frame metadata. And we also got some other feedback. The request was to make the API uh, minimal and remove any unneeded members. Um, so we removed most of the constraints that we presented before, we also uh, removed the mesh representation. We still have the counter remaining. And then we have removed the expressions. Something that is, uh, sorry. Sorry, that was my kid. Uh, so uh, something that is still remaining is the landmarks. Um, we didn't remove landmarks because uh, those are already available in uh, some platform APIs. For example, the HAL3 API that is available on Android and Chrome OS, uh, that is already providing landmarks. So we would have immediately use for the landmarks. And uh, next slide please so here is the new new uh, metadata members uh, what is nice in the video frame metadata is that it actually splits our proposal nicely into uh, two parts first we have the metadata that is used to describe the faces 
and then we have the constraints which are used to uh, control what kind of metadata is generated from the media stream tracks. And on this slide, uh, you can see our proposal for the uh, for the metadata or the description of the faces. We have here a new member human faces into the video frame metadata. Um, that is sequence of human face, which is defined uh, on this slide. And in the human face dictionary, we have four members. ID, which is used for tracking the faces between frames. Then we have probability, uh, which is uh, the likelihood that the detected object is indeed a face. And those are both uh, nullable if some implementation doesn't want to or cannot set the ID and probability, then uh, it can set those members to null. And then we have the counter and landmarks, which are uh, both sequences, point, points in the case of counter and human face landmark in the case of landmarks. And in the upper right corner, you can see the definition for the human face landmark, uh, which is containing two members, the type of the landmark and then the counter. Um, and there are a few different kinds of human face landmarks, basically eye, mouth and nose. And there are some uh, requirements from the video frame metadata registry that the uh, metadata has to fill. And one of the most important or maybe most practical uh, requirements is that the uh, members must be serializable. And next slide, please. Uh, let's go a bit deeper into the details of a few members. I'm not listing all of the members anymore on this slide, but just uh, discuss a bit, bit of some uh, aspects of the members. So for the ID, the ID would be an integer, uh, which is unique integer uh, one, one specific integer used for a specific face between successive frames to track a face. And that is already supported uh, by some of the uh, platform APIs. And then we have the probability. And we would like to define the probability to be a probability as in mathematics. Uh, the platform APIs uh, offer different uh, versions of this. Uh, like in HAL, HAL 3 on Android and Chrome OS, there is a score and on Windows API, there is confidence. But uh, it is possible to convert those into probability. And if an implementation wouldn't want to implement that, it could set that to null. And the probability could, could be in some specific cases, exact one, but that would not be the common case. And then we have the counter. The, uh, the definition for the points in the counter uh, is the same for both landmarks and faces. And there was some discussion that maybe we should just offer bounding box. But um, I think uh, if we would sense the counter into bounding box, it wouldn't much simplify anything because we still would have a member. The only difference basically would be that we would have a, a fixed number of points in the uh, bounding box, but in the contour, we can uh, use a dynamic, dynamic number of points depending on implementation capabilities. And the contour can also specify a bounding box, or it can also specify a center point if, if we 
uh, define that if the contour contains a single point, then that would be the center of the landmark or a face. Uh, next slide, please. And the second aspect or second part of the uh, proposal that we have is the constraints which uh, control how the phase metadata is generated from a media stream track. And here we have two different uh, fields or members in, in each of the uh, dictionaries. And we would have the basically the main switch to control the phase detection uh, phase detection mode, which would be known, which is no phase detection needed, or counter, which would mean that we are not interested in landmarks, but only in phases. And then we would have third phase detection mode, uh, the landmarks, which would uh, include both phases and the landmarks in, in the phases. And we would like to also have the phase detection max contour points, because that can tell the application can use the uh, max contour points to tell the user agent uh, how how much how much how, how complicated algorithms it wants to use. In the simplest case, we would have a bound bounding box with four points. And if the implementation has some uh, slower, more power hungry algorithm, which would return an accurate counter, it doesn't need to use that algorithm if the application tells that it only wants four points. That can save lots of computation in some cases. And that is the reason why we, why we would like to have the um beard to specify also the maximum number of points in the, the counter and next next slide please and here is basically reiteration but i already discussed so we would have the phase direction mode into the constraints uh, with only counter or landmarks, which includes counter and landmarks. And then we would have the max counter points, which would limit the maximum number of counter points that the user agent would return to application for both the face and the landmark. And I think we can skip the rest, rest on this slide and discuss later if needed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here we have a couple of, ex well, a single example with a couple of files. We have main JavaScript file, and then we have a worker. The, uh, the interesting parts are marked with bold here. And basically, this is just using uh, the the video track video track generator and transform stream to extract the video frames from a media stream track, and sending those sending those frames to be processed into the worker, and the worker then gets the metadata from the video frame and just displays the uh, counter points in this case, four points on the console log. And I'm not going more into the details because it's hard to read, read code, but we can refer to this if needed. Uh, next slide, please. So this was basically what I wanted to present. And now I want, would like to ask uh, uh, if, if this is a good proposal for everybody or what senses we might still need to have in that. 
but I think I'm the first on the queue. Uh, thanks. I, I think it's uh, it's improving a lot, uh, and I, I think it's uh, it's exciting to 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 see that work uh, moving forward. Um, a few thoughts coming from uh, your slides. There's probably not no need for knowledgeable dictionary members. Uh, maybe some of them should be required. Uh, I don't know. Uh, like, for instance, maybe contour should be required because if none yeah. is required, you could end up with uh, a metadata which is fully empty. Maybe that's not what you want. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, I, I'm also interested in hearing about like web developers. What like you you were saying? Hey, maybe they, they want the center point, or maybe they want the bounded box, which is like four uh, four points, or maybe they want like the the best contour possible. So I, I was wondering whether a sequence there is best or whether there should be like separate member fields uh, for these things. Um, in in one of your example, you're, uh, I'm also not sure about the face detection max contour points. Uh, do, do, we need, do, do we need it now? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it could be left for later. Um, maybe it should just be a hint. But if we we if we're thinking that people will say, "Oh, I really want four points because I want a bounded box," maybe we should say so. Like allow the web developer to say, "I just want a bounded box," and then we we give it uh, a bounded box object. And uh, if they want like the the best possible uh, contour, then it's a sequence, and they have to deal with the complexity. Um, and also in, in one of your slides, you're using exact in get user media and for new constraints, we, we, we do not uh, allow this. So I would guess we would stick with that approach. So you, you might want to uh, update your example there. Um, that's about it. Uh, so I, I guess you will split uh, your PR in uh, part in web codex and part in, uh, in media capture main, right? Or media capture extensions, I guess. Uh, well, both the metadata and the constraints are now specified in, in the media capture extensions. So, uh, do you think that we should split the metadata part of the specification for the web codex? Uh, um. That's a good question. It's so you will probably be the first one to add a registry entry. Um, I, I was thinking that maybe it should be a, like the document, the registry entry would be the document where the metadata fields would be specified. Uh, the alternative is for, is for the registry a document to to just say, okay, this we are adding this uh, member, and actually the definition is somewhere else in media capture extensions. Um, I guess. Either model is fine. Um, I don't know, Bernard. Do you have any opinion there on what? Well, what uh, like like you said, you and the the registration would be in Web Codex, but it has to reference a spec. It could be media capture expansions, or it could be. Uh, I think it's probably more likely media capture extensions than media capture main, because we're trying to bring media capture main uh, uh, forward. The uh, one aspect is that, um, or one thing to consider is that uh, the constraints and the metadata have dependency. Uh, the constraints are specifying what kind of metadata is going to be stored into the uh, metadata. Uh, so we, if one is updated, it would probably require also updating the other one. And that's why I would like to keep both in the same place. I think that makes sense. Uh, I think there, there was some uh, feedback from the web codec folks that uh, if there's a new version, they would like to review uh, the metadata again. Uh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> then, then, then it's best to have like a document in web codex, which would define the things. And then when you want to update it, it would be in web codex land. So I guess we, we will need to. Uh, the best thing is to to move on with the PRs there, and then we we will see with right. the web also how we should proceed. Uh, Tim Panton, are you in the queue? Uh, yep, I am. I am. Um, so uh, 
I, I like this. This looks useful and interesting. I had a couple of kind of very minor points. Um, I think it would be good to have some language about what the ID, what the lifespan and meaning of the ID is. Um, particularly, it would be good to be confident that it doesn't, like, it doesn't correlate with any anything in the face. So if you get sub get two streams with the same face in, you shouldn't get the same ID. Um, so yeah. you can't correlate across streams. Um, you don't want it to be your social security number. Right, right, exactly. Um, and and so just some language there about like, you know, the properties of the ID would be would be great. Um, I mean, I think that's where you where you were going anyway. But I think it would be good to have the language explicit there. Um, and then the other thing is, I I agree with you, Anne, about the four in the bounding box because they're not strictly the same. Like you could have a sequence of of four points that didn't end up being a bounding box because of the ordering. So I think I think it would be clearer to make them separate things rather than assuming that four always ends up being a bounding box. Uh, regarding the bounding box, um, uh, you are definitely right that uh, four point counter is not same as bounding box. But the application, it's trivial to calculate bounding box from uh, counterpoints. And if, if in the future there will be uh, more complicated counter, then we would need new, new fields, new members, and that would clutter the metadata. And I would like to avoid that if possible. Uh, Harold? Yeah. Um, where was that? Sorry, I lost it. I'll come back to that. Okay. Uh, Jan Ivar? Uh, yes, so uh, just taking a step back here, uh, I think there's a larger question here, right? Of uh, do we merge this and does it look good overall? And uh, from a privacy perspective, as far as I can tell, these are just optimizations and that that's something that applications could could figure out on their own it would just be slower so i don't see any inherent uh, problem uh, with it <clears throat> i don't know if it was mentioned but it seemed to me that for this working group the, the parts that are relevant are only the constraints part and maybe the the metadata part should be in the realm of web codex i don't know if that's what you and said earlier but i would i would support uh maybe that split um and other than that i think uh, this looks good okay so the next step would be to submit a pr is that or what what is what what is the next step here uh, uh some kind of cfc or I guess PR would be better because a C, a C, you, it might be good to have a CFC on documents that we think are, are ready. So PRs, then we editors can uh, look at it and iron out, and then maybe CFC. I okay. I, I don't know. But, yeah. I, I think definitely a CFC would be good uh, at some point. Uh, I don't know how much we want to clean things up first or after that. I'm open. Okay. All right. I think we need to move on to the next item. We're already ten minutes over time. Uh, so, Elad. Yes. Thank you. Everybody can hear me. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about adding a message port on a capture handle. Uh, part of my argument that it should be tied with capture handle, but theoretically any message port that allows a capturing uh, application to communicate with a captured application is uh, the right scope for me. Um, so let's just recall, next slide please, uh, why we have capture handle. Capture handle allows an application to, uh, sorry, one slide back, thank you. Uh, capture handle allows an application to declare uh, it's um, to opt into expose metadata to a capturer. So for example, right now uh, we see that uh, Bernard is controlling uh, slides and uh, meet, right? And theoretically, 
Slides could declare, hey, I'm Slides, here's my session ID, and here's how you can phone home, right? And Meet can use that to communicate directly with Slides. For example, it can, uh, you know, it can be the name of a broadcast channel if both of them are on the same um, origin, right? It can be an IP address. It can be a session ID that's mutually intelligible given some shared cloud infrastructure like Google has. Um, and when that happens, those two applications can now start communicating. And in the case of Meet and Slides, if Bernard happens to have the right kind of account, then Meet is going to allow uh, Bernard to control the slides directly from inside of Meet. Next slide, please. So uh, as we know, as we have mentioned, this communication happens over shared cloud infrastructure in our case, or actually, sorry, it happens locally using some hack that allows you to have a broadcast channel that is same origin because Meet and Slides are not really same origin, but they can embed a same origin iframe and communicate through it. And, you know, it's a bit hacky. Furthermore, once storage, uh, storage partitioning is going to be implemented, it won't uh, be possible anymore, for example, with the site like YouTube, right? So we have a case where even if both uh, entities control, both uh, the same entity controls both applications, the applications might not be able to communicate locally and communicating over shared cloud infrastructure incurs costs. It's less robust, it's less efficient, and it makes use of scarce resource uh, in the uh, scarce resource in scarce resource in the form of bandwidth. So what I'm proposing is a message board. Instead, capture and capture start communicating directly. Next slide, please. Now there are a couple of challenges here, and I would like to start uh, enumerating them. Number one, when you capture somebody, uh, you capture a tab, but that tab can be navigated, right? So at any moment, you can find that you're now capturing somebody else, or maybe the entity that you want to communicate with, you only start capturing it two minutes into the capture. Similarly, uh, Chrome, for example, allows uh, to press a button inside of Chrome to share this tab instead. So at any moment, the user can decide that you're capturing some other application, even if no navigation takes place. Third, uh, applications take time to load. So they might start, they might become uh, ready to receive messages after the capture is started or before it starts. So all of those communicating um, uh, complicating factors mean that the solution would not be just to expose a message port, but also to expose some events that are tied in so that you would know when you can, use, can start using the message port and when you can no longer use that message port, and maybe now you can use a different message port because you're capturing something else. And the nice thing here is that all of those problems have already been consider, uh, considered and resolved for Capture Handle, right? So Capture Handle already has events that tell you most of these things. Next slide, please. Now, when we go to examine what kind of solution we want to uh, have here for message port, uh, I just want to remind us that we probably would like to keep uh, the design principle that the capturee does not realize it's being captured unless the capture allows that, right? So the, uh, the person, uh, the entity that picks up the phone and dials is going to be the capturer, and the capturee is going to pick up the phone and answer, or not. Next slide, please. So the API that I'm uh, suggesting is as follows. First, we see capture handle config. This is the um, this is the dictionary that we have nowadays that the cap a captured website can use uh, in order to declare its metadata without even though even if it's being captured. It can say, hey, do I want to expose my origin? Here's my free floating handle, which can be a string, well, sorry, which is a string and can be a session ID, for example. And it can also kind of uh, use allow list or blacklist, you know, to control who actually sees that. I suggest that we just had an event handler here, okay? And the events are gonna be of the type of, of, hey, have I started being captured or stopped being captured? And if I have, here's the port there for which this is relevant. And you can imagine, first time you get captured uh, by a given entity, you're gonna get the start. And when for whatever reason it stops capturing you, be it because share this step instead was pressed or if something got navigated or if it just decided to terminate the capture, you get the same event, only we've stopped. And then you know, oh, this port is no longer relevant. Next slide, please. 
And on the side, uh, the capturing side, uh, similar things are going to happen. Okay. So right now, you when you start capturing, you can examine the capture handle. If the captured site did not set up anything, and, did, and namely in this case, did not set a handler, you just don't get any handle, right? And you don't get any port. You know, hey, I'm capturing some kind of legacy website that been collected to set the capture handle. But if you do get one, you can say uh, you can see, oh, this website can actually support a message port, right? Because not any website that sets a capture handle is actually gonna do, uh, also be able to uh, receive uh, messages over a port. But if the site you capture does support that, you can now call um, um, a method called get message port, and you get the port. And the other side, the one that you're capturing, is getting a, gets an event saying like, "Hey, you are being captured, and that entity wants to talk to you." And here's the port, right? And now both sides have a port, and they can communicate. Likewise, if either side can no longer uh, can no longer communicate for whatever reason, both sides are going to become aware of that. So, for example, if the user presses stop, then both sides are going to know, "Hey, I've stopped," right? So. In the case of the captured website, it's going to get the event with the stopped type. And in the, on the side of the capture, it's going to just realize that, hey, the entire capture went away, and that's going to be its signal, right? Uh, there should be an event for that. Or if, the, if, for example, the user navigates or anything navigates the captured site's uh, top-level document, there's already an event for that in capture handle. And that event is now going to be annotated with the message point invalidated uh, flag. And then the capturer will know, hey, this port no longer useful, no need to send any messages over it. Um, there are a couple of finer details. Uh, next slide, please. And we can either discuss them now if anybody brings them up, or otherwise, I encourage people to uh, look at the full proposal in the link provided. And I would love to iterate over this now. So uh, next slide, and I've given up the mic. I I saw you Anna's first, but uh, is anybody else here? I don't know if uh, Yaniver is from before or uh, Harold. Like which one? Of I you don't know either. Sorry. Yeah. Are you first, Yaniver, or is it me? Uh, I think you're first. Okay. Um, so I think in general, having a, uh, a message channel between capture and capturee uh, makes uh, sense. Uh, so I, I think we, we, we could see that happening. Um, I think the API shape, uh, there, there are some things that seems a bit off, but uh, we can work that, we can work, work on that. Uh, there are things like uh, expose origin, for instance, equal false, and uh, you can use message port. That does not make sense. We should probably have mandate expose origin to true. Uh, a event handler in the dictionary is, seems uh, uh, a bit weird. Usually, you have event handler on, on objects, and then you can uh, register event handler, add event listener, and so on. So that's probably uh, what we want there as well. Uh, I'm not sure we need support message port. Uh, so may, maybe we, I, I would try to remove at first as much as we can. And uh, so that's why I'm, I'm saying it supports message port. I, I'm not sure. And the same for message port invalidated. Um, I think that for message port invalidated, it may be good to discuss uh, this with uh, over HTML spec folks uh, because it's. Uh, it's it's a it's a thing with message channel that uh, you have two message ports and uh, they're in two different uh, documents and one will go away and the other one will not know about it and that's already uh, an existing issue so it, there's nothing new here so I, I wonder whether uh, the, there's a good pattern or whether there's something else that needs to be solved before we we address this issue there so maybe we should also uh, like make it uh remove it at first and then discuss it later and um also the name get message port uh i, I i'd like something like open something like uh, you know because get message port seems like a very uh uh like it's a get so it's not mutating anything but it, it's actually opening a message channel so it's revealing to the capture that that it's being captured 
So may, maybe you should have a, a good name there that is saying, hey, it's not like a simple get. It's something like uh, a bit more evolving as well. And uh, yeah, the integration with capture controller, I think, makes sense as well. Uh, we have this new object, so it seems good to, to use it. So that's uh, a good placeholder, I think. So uh, what I'm hearing is, A, uh, you approve the use case. So that's great. Uh, so you, you agree that the message port is necessary. Uh, not exactly in order, but you said that you would like to rename from get message port to open message port. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you mentioned that you would like to remove a couple of things if it is if we can discover that they're not totally necessary. And definitely, I agree with the sentiment. And we can iterate over the um, particular details. Um, I think, given the time limit, I don't know if we want to deep dive into any of the details you've mentioned, but I'm definitely open to uh, discussing them. Yeah, we can um, we can do that later on. I see you in the queue, so maybe yeah. it would be good. To I just back. want one clarification, if possible. Um, so uh, one that I need to give to the group, I've given it, so I believe that you and uh, Yaniv have seen it in the uh, thread, but I also want to mention the complicating factor of um, a tab can be captured by multiple different uh, captures at the same time, which is part of why I want an event, right? Because the page can be captured multiple times, and this pattern uh, acknowledges that. Uh, one clarification I would like to ask of you, and then I'll uh, move on to Yaniv. You mentioned that you like the tying with capture controller. I wonder what you think about the tying with capture handle. So I'm basically my uh, proposal ties it both to capture handle as well as the capture controller. Uh, I don't know about that. Um, I, I don't like the event handle in the dictionary. That seems wrong. So that, that seems wrong to me. So we uh, we should change it. Whether it's capture handle or media devices, uh, I, I don't have a, a strong opinion there. Uh, definitely. Uh, I mean, I guess that knowing who you're talking to, knowing that the capture, uh, if I'm a capturer, I think I need the origin of a capture before calling a uh, get message port. And uh, that's why, uh, conceptually speaking, like having like, uh, yeah, uh, I'm using capture handle to say I'm exposing my origin uh, and putting API there uh, seems to make sense as well. So that's why the tying, like that, that might be fine. Uh, as well. Okay. Um, I only partially understand the concern here because I think that uh, a web application that always checks the origin, right, is just going to find that an undefined origin never matches what its uh, uh, allow list, right? So if your allow list is apple.com mm -hmm. and apple.se, excellent. Undefined is not, does not match that. But we shouldn't allow uh, to have origin be being undefined or uh, empty. We shouldn't allow this. Um, we can iterate over that later. It's not clear to me why not, but sure. Um, I'll just mention one more thing. Sorry, neighbor. Is that a capture hand the, the tie to capture handle happens on both sides? And you've only mentioned so far why you don't like it on the captured side, right? Like you don't like an event handler in the dictionary. What about the other side? So that side, sure. If it's on media devices instead, doesn't make much of a difference to me. What about on? Might even be better, right? I need to think about this. Uh, I'm more interested in having it tied in the event hand, I'm sorry, everything else exposed in events that are already fired for capture handle. Uh, I would go with capture controller there. Uh, I think that capture handle, if we want it, should, should be moved to uh, capture controller. And uh, because we, we don't want it in media track, that's a bad idea to tie it to media track. We should tie it to the object that represents the source, and that's capture controller. So we should move it to capture controller, all these things. Okay. Does it mean that you want basically the same kind of, um, sorry, I don't want to put uh, words in your mouth, I'm doing it, uh, so I'm acknowledging it. But if the same events were basically fired on capture controller, but it's the same kind of logic for the same kind of events, like, hey, when the user navigates the top level page, when the user uh, closes the tab, when the user, you know, uh, presses share this tab instead, et cetera. Because it seems like there will be some duplication there, but th that's not a showstopper for me. Mm, I'm not sure to follow, but let, let's go with Yonivar. We can we can okay. continue the discussion. Yeah, we're, we're almost out of time. Do we understand what the action item is uh, for this discussion? What the uh, next step is? It's not clear to me, but may, maybe Yonivar's uh, input is gonna help there. Let's see, like, what his uh, position is. Sure. Uh, I, I think uh, I like to. I, I really like the first part of your presentation. I think you got the requirements down right, and I, I agree with the overall use case. 
Uh, I think uh, when it comes to API shape, uh, I hope we can iterate on GitHub. I also had a, a, a similar proposal plan, but I decided it was too early. Um, and but I think uh, you've highlighted some of the. Uh, so generally, I would I would agree with you. And we want to get move away from media stream track. I want to put it on the capture controller. And um, my proposal was also looking at uh, uh, post message, uh, more of a post message API. Uh, but it's also concerning the other direction. But I agree, it's it. This makes sense to start with the with the direction you're presenting. And I hope we can iterate uh, on GitHub on the actual API shape. OK, so uh, thank you. Uh, so Bernard, I think that might answer the question of next items. I think that we can have some convergence here, where basically we take this general structure, but we don't use the pre-existing capture handle events. We uh, set similar events, but on capture, head, uh, on capture controller. And but basically, it's going to be this pattern where the captured side says, hey, that's my event controller if I get the message for it. And the capturer says, like, hey, I want to start the connection. Uh, the other side gets an event. They start communicating. And if the user or navigation or something like that breaks off the connection, there's going to be another event that says, hey, this message port you used to hold, possibly one of several, this one is now invalidated. And maybe it's not exactly an invalidated flag, but something, some kind of event. Does that? And UN would like us to uh, check if this problem was solved differently before. And if so, we can adopt that solution. Did I get that right? I would say I agree with the requirements, not the shape. I think we still need to work on the shape. OK. Um, so I'm not ready to commit on shape yet. OK. So the next steps, I guess, is uh, basically to uh, schedule a slot for this in uh, one month. OK. Thank you. All right. I'll try to go fast on, on, uh, on the remaining slides. Uh, which is, um, yes, so uh, a long-standing issue in Media Capture Main has been we have a bit of a broken foreground detection, which is that to call get user media was supposed to require both a page be visible and have keyboard focus. And uh, implementations differ on this. Um, uh, and Firefox is the one only one, I think, that actually requires focus. But it also, it has some flaws in that it required too much focus in that you could have an iframe and it would actually require early versions. Not, we fixed it now, so it only requires focus of the browser window, not necessarily the, of the iframe. Uh, so a PR here was long overdue. There were some other challenges um, as well that we want to try to satisfy. So this PR tries to do uh, uh, two things. And the first thing is to allow what we saw in Safari is that um, I, I have a demo here you can click on, but I'm basically walk through it. Uh, Safari allows you to, uh, I, I made a demo test fiddle that basically you push a button, camera button, and then five seconds countdown, and then it will open Get User Media. And then by before those five seconds expire, I'll focus a different window. And then when five, when it, after five seconds, we will still see a prompt appear in the window that does not have focus. Uh, this is useful because um, it maintains anti-spying because you click, you still have to click on the window implicitly giving it focus before anything is captured. But it maintains the anti-spying property and give, gives users a chance to see that a request was made. So I think we should allow this. So that means uh, relaxing the current focus requirement a little bit. Uh, next slide. So the proposal is to push the upfront focus test that we have right now, push it down into the algorithm further down after the prompt. And up front, we will replace it with an is in view check. And this is basically uh, uh, testing that uh, the, the page visibility is visible, basically, is what this would mean. And uh, if the relevant global object's associated document is fully active and its visibility state is visible, return true. That's the is in view check. And so we also had. Um, uh, we also needed to fix some, uh, the old pros had some flaws in it that it was accessing the document off the main thread. So this text also takes care of fixing that. And so to the focus test remains, but it's actually found further down. Next slide. Um, after the stall, uh, there's a place in the algorithm after permission has been requested. 
where we basically say if the user never responds, the algorithm stalls on this step. Uh, there's also a call out for uh, the result of the request is denied. I haven't changed the order of those, even though maybe they should be changed. But after that, whether you see the green line, there's a new test for has system focus. And again, the wording is a bit uh, awkward because it basically has to do a dis dispatch to main thread in order to um, access the the uh, document. Uh, so uh, this has changed from, this used to be a, a focus test of the document or the iframe. And this is now uh, instead relying on a, a new HTML uh, property, which is system focus of the top level browsing context. And that's as close to the browser has focus that we have today. Uh, I have a PR. I have a PR up for the HTML spec to also add a new concept called uh, user attention, which would solve this. Would which would be more uh, directly the uh, the browser has focused. There's an edge case here in some browsers. Uh, so in some browsers, when you click the URL bar to type as a user, you actually defocus the page, and in others you don't. So this would take care of that. And so that is the first part of the PR. Any thoughts on this part? Any objections to this yeah, relaxation um, of focus? I particularly like uh, the, this slide, the slide that we are seeing there. Uh, I didn't know about this system focus, uh, but the weight uh, makes sense to me. I think it's uh, it's close to what we have in, in, uh, in WebKit. Um, so that, that looks good to me. All right, great. Any other comments, objections to this part? So my reading of the document is that uh, what, it, uh, what it does is, is to do the waiting after the GAM prompt has popped up and not, uh, not before it, or af after the GAM prompt has been replied to actually. No, uh, yeah, that, the intent was after the gun prompt has been shown up, uh, has shown up, yes. Uh, it was not my intent to say after it has been responded to. Yeah. Um, because in, in order to respond to it, you will usually have to click on it, which re requires focus, which, you know, implicitly invokes focus, right? Yep. So I'm, uh, I'm worried if, if it's actually stating the right thing in all cases, but uh, I'll read, I'll try to read the PR carefully. Just don't count me as saying yes yet. yet. Uh, I'll, I'll mark you as, as a reviewer if I haven't already. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, all right, so there's a second part to this um, because I was cleaning up a lot. So. Uh, separately, um, there was a, oh, there's a hand. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, it's possible to ask for a quick clarification. Uh, of a, sure. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, um, but I know that you've got five minutes and I don't want to steal your time. So basically, I didn't really understand what you were saying about anti-spine, um, you know, and uh, Safari. I'm sorry. I feel like it's kind of basic, but I missed that completely. Oh. Uh, it maintains the existing requirements uh, of focus, but this PR only delays the focus test to after the prompt. So uh, it doesn't change anything else. So I don't think we need to go into, uh, you know, I'm not trying to challenge the focus requirement on uh, on this PR, uh, which um, I believe exists for anti-spying reasons, but I don't think we need to go into it. Uh, okay, I'll repeat the question on GitHub then. All right, cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, so next slide is, <clears throat> um, in, in keeping with this, we had another, um, in trying to clean this up and make it more consistent, uh, we had some uh, users uh, also concerned that they wanted to, enumerate devices would block on them, and they didn't have a good way to detect that. They wanted to call enumerate devices on startup page load for some reason. So uh, in keeping with this relaxation, it also, we also started to question, well, why do we have a focus requirement on the numerate devices? Uh, so this proposal is to drop the, and it's optional in the spec, so a user agent may or may not implement it. The user, uh, it's an option the user agent can also require focus 
for enumerate devices. So this proposal is to drop that requirement and reduce it to being visible. The rationale here is web compat because uh, then more browsers would work the same. And the, the other rationale is that for enumerate devices, the mitigation is to, supposed to be anti-fingerprint, not anti-spying. Uh, the focus requirement or get used to media was basically and quickly that uh, requiring focus for turning on the camera or microphone seemed like a good privacy mitigation because that meant only the page you're interacting with can suddenly decide to turn on and spy on you. Uh, but for enumerate devices, we, there's no anti-spying necessary. It's just anti-fingerprint. So a clear, simpler visibility check seems better. It's also better because iframes without focus today cannot tell when the browser window receives focus. And apps like the Unity front end uh, who filed an issue want to be able to make a deterministic check, which they could do with this PR. And they can now, uh, because of the way the PR changes when we um, uh, check the document, we do it synchronously. It means that they can actually write this code. If document visibility state equals visible, then they know they will know for a fact that they can call enumerate devices and not have it block, which seems a desirable uh, invariant. Now this opens up a concern, which is that if you have two or more browser windows open at once uh, that have that are accessing the camera or microphone or have accessed it since they were opened, it means that sites may now use polling of the enumerate devices or the device change event to time correlate users across origins if the users insert a USB or Bluetooth device or removes the device. Uh, the solution is that we already have existing pros put in for that that says uh, these device change events are potentially triggered simultaneously on documents of different origins. User agents may add fuzzing on the timing of events to avoid cross-origin activity correlation. And my what I would emphasize here is that the spec puts no time limits on this kind of fuzzing, which means that any kind of time delay, a user agent seems open and uh, it seems uh, fine for a user agent to put in as much time as it wants to quell any cross activity correlation concerns, which could in fact be as long as you know uh, a focus. And next slide. <clears throat> Just to go over the last changes of the PR. Um, to do this, it would basically be a new, new Boolean that's called proceed. That is the result of the de existing device enumeration can proceed steps. This is done synchronously. And as a second step, uh, and at the beginning of the in parallel step, we add the pause that exists today without um, access and be careful to check the document on the queued task. And this makes the initial check synchronous based on the synchronous result, I should say, which makes it deterministic. Thoughts? Um, you went? Yes, yeah, so, so so your your desire is um, to reduce a little bit the friction of uh, web developers so that we have some middle ground and then all uh, user agents uh, get to the same place. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I think it's good to try that. My question would be, um, so let's say that we that you you implement this. Uh, do you think that, that there will be a compat issues, uh, or do you think that the, the current relaxing is solving like almost all the issues, the existing issues or the future issues? Uh, those are two questions. I think if, if all browsers, I would hope all browsers would implement this, and once we do that, I don't think there would be any web compat issues, and I think applications would be much happier, and it would definitely solve the Unity problem, I think, which and was for, the application that mentioned this. And for existing Firefox issues, are you confident that this will uh, fix the issues, or do you think that it will require adoption by web developers to actually uh, fix uh, Firefox issues? I believe uh, Firefox already relies on, um, uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? 
So the issue is, so some developers are, are complaining that uh, this requirement is not good and that uh, it's breaking uh, their website on, on Firefox. So uh, I'm wondering whether this relaxation yeah. is, uh, is good enough to unbreak the web application or it's good enough so. that web, web developers will easily change their application to actually unbreak uh, websites on Firefox. Oh, I see. Yes, they would have to add that um, if you go a couple of slides up to if visibility, one slide up. Uh, if visibility state equals visible, uh, then you can call uh, enumerate devices. That is the way to, if you're concerned about being quote unquote blocked, which mm -hmm. isn't really blocked, but it's in a, you know, yeah. async await. Yeah. Okay. All right, any objections to this one? Uh, not exactly an objection, but um, I'm sorry, I don't think that I fully understood this from the presentation. I uh, would really enjoy, uh, uh, appreciate more time uh, to look into this, but, you know, I'm just one person here. Okay, um, would it, I, I'm open to discuss with you uh, any questions you might have after the meeting or at any time. Um, so what is that well, since we're out of time what is the next step here do we have a have a clear um follow-up well think, uh, i'd like to go ahead yeah I, I was thinking that getting both uh user uh, agent implementers and web, web developers feedback would be would be good uh and so, so we still need that, to gather that feedback but as um, does that imply a cfc or i'm just trying to understand what what's the next step here Well, I would hope that uh, as long as we can get user agent uh, input, I, I think web developers should be happy because this is a relaxation. Uh, they should, should only make them more happy, not less happy. Right? It may not go as far as uh, some de develop developers want, but it doesn't prevent us from going further. There are some web developers on the GitHub issue, so maybe maybe we could get can get that, that input since they are already involved in the discussion. Okay. Do we need yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we need the privacy review given the relaxation, or do you think that's below the radar? Um, we could also initiate that if we feel that's necessary. Although I do believe we already uh, provide fuzzing, and I actually don't think we need to because the, the focus requirement on uh, enumerate devices was always optional, right? So it would be only browsers like Firefox that wanted to add that focus requirement that would be mostly impacted by this. So I don't think it needs privacy review in the end. This is a relaxation from our point of view. So we would probably have to add a little more work to improve our fuzzing to cover the case where you have two open browser windows. I will say the same thing as for the other change in focus requirements that and I will have to have re to have to have to review this in detail or to figure out if it's something that we, is acceptable to go along with. As you say, it would be very nice if the whole web were was agreeing that to do things the same way. All right, thanks. Can we delegate this for final review by Harold and Yuan then, or? And Elad, yeah, I think that would be great. Um, yeah. At least from my side, like it's okay if it uh, happens uh, by next uh, Thursday, not before. I hope that's okay uh, for your timeline. Not this Thursday. Yes, my apologies. Sure. <laughs> no worries. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. I think we're done for today then. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.